2024 is coming to a close and SpaceX is gearing up for a monumental year in 2025. We've seen loads of work on the hardware for Pad B here in Starbase, including preparations for installation of the tower's chopstick arms. There's also been continuing work on Pad A to prepare for Starship's next launch, Flight 7, which received FAA approval this week. And on top of all of that, the booster for the launch after next, that's Booster 15 and Flight 8, is beginning its testing campaign. Howdy Tank Watchers, I'm Jack Beyer for NSF and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Henson Shaving. Let's start off by talking about the next flight of Starship, because after saying this in last week's Starbase update, and Ship 33's engine test campaign potentially complete, there was a surprise static fire of Ship 33 like minutes after the episode went live. It looked a little different than usual though, and at first we suspected it was a single engine static fire test. Thankfully, we didn't have to speculate about it much because SpaceX confirmed the day after that indeed, this was a single engine static fire test. The Post mentioned that this was, quote, demonstrating flight-like startup for an in-space burn, end quote. This was very similar to what we saw with some previous vehicles like Ship 26, Ship 28, and Ship 29 as well. At the time, SpaceX was trying to get a test like this done on the ground so they could eventually demonstrate an in-flight relight of a Raptor engine in zero-g conditions. We didn't get that from Ship 28 on Starship's third flight, nor was it planned on Ship 29's flight for Flight 4 and Ship 26 never flew as much as Kevin would have liked that, but we did get an in-space relight on Starship's sixth flight with Ship 31, and we could see a similar test done on Flight 7 with Ship 33. As a reminder, Ship 33 is the first ship of a new generation of Starship vehicles, so of course there are lots of upgrades, and this includes upgrades to the header tanks as well. From their geometry to how they're manufactured, and even the design of their transfer tubes, the header tanks have changed quite a bit it would make sense to test all of that on the ground and in space, so it wouldn't be surprising if we see SpaceX repeat the in-space relight on Flight 7. Speaking of Flight 7, this week we got a lot closer to this flight with the FAA granting the license modification for the launch. We have a whole video talking a lot more in depth about this approval, but basically this clears Starship for the next launch. Given what the FAA said, we also now have full confirmation that the flight is going to be suborbital just like all the previous missions. The plan will be to launch the full stack from Starbase, the booster will then attempt to return to the launch site, and if it can't, it'll be able to abort into the Gulf of Mexico. And the ship will be splashing down, of course, in the Indian Ocean once again. Now, you may think, wait a minute, why fly the same profile yet again? It's true that it might be the same profile, but this is the first launch of a Block 2 ship, which means they're going to learn a lot from this flight, and they're going to be able to compare that with the previous launches of Block 1 ships under a similar profile. Plus, we only know that it's launching from Starbase with the ship splashing down in the Indian Ocean. Whatever happens in between doesn't necessarily have to be written down in the license. SpaceX could try another in-space relight. They could try once again actuating the payload bay door since it's a new design on Block 2. Heck, they could even deploy a dummy Starlink to test the deployment systems. Although, given the last flight's payload being a banana, they could also dump a ton of plushy bananas into a suborbital trajectory. Plushy banana meteor shower, anyone? Just put little bits of tungsten in each banana. If, uh, if anyone out there wants to fund my startup, let me know. So, all of this is to say, there's still a lot SpaceX might try out, and just because we don't know right now doesn't mean there'll be some differences on Flight 7 that just aren't in the license. Next, we're going to talk about all the work at the pad to prepare for this upcoming flight of Starship, but first, a word from this video's sponsor, Henson Shaving. Hey, it's the holidays, and if you know someone who shaves, then you found the perfect gift that keeps on giving. It's the AL-13 Razor from Henson Shaving. When Henson's AL-13 Razor showed up in the mail, I admit, I was a bit intimidated by its minimalist design and single blade, but after using it for just a few shaves and getting the hang of it, I now prefer it to any other razor I've used. Heck, I used it this morning. Henson is all about precision. In fact, their razors are made in an aerospace machine shop. That means the blade can stick out just 13 ten thousandths of an inch. That's 0 0.0013 of an inch. It even looks like aerospace or spaceflight hardware. Who doesn't love a finely machined part? I also like that there's no plastic waste involved. 
I can recycle the blades and feel good about not just adding more crud into a landfill. Plus, each blade costs like 10 cents, which means your gift will keep on giving with years of savings. So to get or gift an excellent shave, click the link in the description or go to hensonshaving.com slash spaceflight and use code spaceflight at checkout. You'll get 100 free blades with the purchase of a razor. That's like three years of shaves. Thanks again to Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video and for making a great product. So with regulatory approval now cleared and the vehicles probably a couple weeks away from rollout to the pad, SpaceX is working quickly to complete refurbishment and upgrade work on the launch site ahead of Starship's seventh flight. Over the last week or so, we've noticed a lot of work going on on the booster quick disconnect on pad A's launch mount. You may be aware of how this particular piece of hardware always gets cooked every single launch, and even on Booster 12's catch. SpaceX has had problems on pretty much every launch with hot gas intrusion into the quick disconnect housing. We saw a few flights ago how they completely changed the door, for example, with a new redesigned one. We've seen them weld more protection plates and also try to seal it better, but it seems like all of this might not have been enough. And that's because, as I was saying, this week they worked on it a lot, and that included, once again, more work trying to seal the housing. It seems like some of the access panels on the side of the booster quick disconnect housing got replaced by permanent protection panels welded to the structure. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how SpaceX solves all of this on the second pad here at Starbase and also at 39A, where a similar launch mount design is planned. This week, there was also a lot of work being done on the carriage system and chopstick arms for pad A. Some of this might still be some inspections, refurbishment, and upgrade work from the last flight, but now there's also work happening to prepare for the next launch. Part of that work involved reinstalling the ship lifting pins on the chopsticks. Well, it was technically not the pins themselves, but the structures that connect the pins to the chopsticks. These structures swing in and out of the arms and allow those pins to attach to sockets on the ship that help the chopsticks arms lift the vehicles up on top of a booster. So of course, without these, SpaceX wouldn't be able to stack a ship and we wouldn't be seeing a flight anytime soon. One interesting thing to note though, is that on the previous structures, one of them, the one on the north chopstick, was skewed a bit to compensate for a slight misalignment of the launch mount relative to the chopsticks. But these new ones are both straight and none are skewed, so either SpaceX found a way to solve this or we might be missing something in this whole arrangement. We'll definitely pay close attention to this when the time comes to lift Ship 33 on top of Booster 14 for Flight 7. Another thing that we've seen recently as we get close to a launch is SpaceX installing protective boxes on some of the critical hardware at the tank farm. We saw that this week as well, so that's a good sign that we are getting close to Flight 7. While the tank farm is protected by a berm, it's not good to take chances with some of the more finicky pieces of hardware in there. Anything that can further protect all of that means less work after flight on refurbishment and inspections and everything else. The whole idea of reducing the work required after every flight is seriously important. We make a note of this in practically every episode, but it's worth keeping in mind. SpaceX wants to go all in next year with Starship's cadence. They want up to 25 flights in 2025, which means things need to happen a lot quicker. In fact, last week we pointed out that, in order for this to happen, SpaceX must be days away from rolling the Starship vehicles for Flight 8 out to the Massey Outpost for cryo-testing. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened this week. Well, at least for the booster. Booster 15 was lifted off of its workstation in Mega Bay 1 and onto the booster thrust simulator stand. Then it was rolled to the Massey Outpost. There it will go through a round of cryogenic proof testing while also being subjected to the forces it will see from its Raptor engines during launch and landing, courtesy of that thrust simulator stand. Once that testing is done, which given previous timelines, it should be in a matter of a few days, then Booster 15 will be rolled back to Mega Bay 1 for engine installation. This will line up nicely with the upcoming Flight 7 because once that's off the ground, Booster 15 will then be able to roll to the pad for engine testing and, well, you kind of need the launch mount free for that. In the case of Ship 34, the ship for Flight 8, we've still not seen it roll out for cryo testing, at least at the time of recording this video, but it could be soon. In fact, it wouldn't be surprising if SpaceX wants to get that knocked out before the end of the year. Another thing that we always try to emphasize on these Starbase update episodes is that the work at Starbase is not just for the next launch, there's a lot of work always going on to prepare for multiple flights down the line. Last week we mentioned how Booster 16's top half had already been finished, which meant that it's just one stack away 
from being fully completed. This week, we've seen more potential work on this booster in the form of raceways being lifted and moved into Mega Bay 1. These raceways hold the important channels that go up and down the booster and contain the pressurization lines and wiring for all the systems and whatnot. It's like the booster's nerves and respiratory system. Without it, the whole thing just wouldn't work. What we've noticed recently is that these raceways are often installed when they're close to welding both halves of the booster to complete its structure. So this is a great sign that we're close to seeing a new booster completed here at Starbase. It's so exciting to see that not just the launch and testing cadence are ramping up, but even the vehicle production cadence seems to be ramping up as well. We've also been able to see this ramp up with ship production. Last week we went through the nose cone production steps at the Star Factory, and it's probably worth comparing that with the latest that we've seen. We'll start with the earliest step in the production with Ship 38. Last week we talked about its LOX header tank just being on one of the jigs all alone, but now this week SpaceX has put the ship's nose cone on top of it and even already welded it in place. In the case of Ship 37's nose cone, which is a little bit further along, not a lot has changed since last week, at least that we can see from the outside. The step that it's at right now is the one where they weld the methane header tank inside and then there's a bunch of other internal structures that are added for COPVs, the flap actuators, and a host of other things. The same thing can't be said of Ship 36's nose cone, which has made tremendous progress when it comes to installing its heat shield. While last week we'd only seen the protective felt and the layer of ablative material being installed on this nose cone, it now has a ton of tiles installed. And mind you, this was all done in like a week of work. It's safe to say there's probably lots more progress on other parts of these vehicles inside the Star Factory, but unfortunately we can't see that. Speaking of things that we've seen happening lately and we can't fully tell what's going on, you know how there's always some weird hardware rolling around Starbase and we don't have any idea what it is until many days, weeks, or sometimes even years later? Yep, there's a new one of those. Yay. First, we had this weird piece of hardware that was rolled into the production site from the Sanchez lot. It's almost an entire circle with one part flat. We saw it going into Mega Bay 2 and being lifted inside of the building near where the welding turntable is located. While we have no idea what this might be for, it's true that lately SpaceX has been outfitting the inside of Mega Bay 2 with access platforms and stands in order to be able to better reach hardware as it's being worked on inside the building. It wouldn't be shocking to think that perhaps this hardware might have something to do with some kind of stand or platform that would allow teams to get close to the ships as they're being worked on on the turntable. Another strange piece of hardware we saw this week was this strange looking white beam going into the high bay. It's even harder to guess what this one's for, but maybe we'll be able to figure it out when we see what comes out of the high bay in the near future. Now, not all of the weird looking hardware that arrives at Starbase is a complete mystery. Thankfully, sometimes, even though some stuff might look weird, it's not hard to guess what it will be for. This is the case with the parts for the flame bucket that will be installed on the second launch pad at Starbase. Last week we saw the first big piece for this arrive at Starbase, and this week we've seen even more pieces arrive. These are being sent to the Sanchez lot where they're being put together along with the support structure that will hold this massive flame diverter inside the trench at pad B. I cannot wait to see this thing completed and rolling to the pad for installation. It's going to be epic! and. Hopefully, having a proper flame trench and everything will mean that Pad B is an even more photogenic launch pad than Pad A. Hopefully. Another epic piece of hardware being put together is the launch mount for Pad B. This work is also taking place at the Sanchez lot, and this week we saw a lot more progress on it, including the start of the installation of the water-cooled top layer. You remember how I mentioned earlier in the video that the booster quick disconnect gets absolutely roasted on every launch? That's also true for the top of the launch mount. And such a roasting is not suitable for a rapid launch cadence without heavy refurbishment. One way to avoid all this is to make it water cooled, just like the current flame deflector at pad A and the giant flame diverter being put together for pad B. As of the time of this recording, we've seen two pieces for this top water cooled layer of pad B's launch mount, so of course there's a lot more work left to complete it, but it's cool to see this part of the build begin. We've also seen teams lowering into the launch mount these pieces of hardware which go on the inner side of the mount in between the hold down arms. These plates will eventually protect all of the fiddly bits in the mount from all of the heat, pressure, and acoustic energy from the Raptor engines on Super Heavy. Some interesting work that we've seen related to Pad B lately has been the arrival of the chopstick installation jig. This jig consists of two red structures that support the carriage system and the chopsticks while they're being put together before being lifted and installed on the launch tower. 
We've seen the same process for Tower 1, and also for the tower at Kennedy Space Center's 39A. In fact, looking at the timelines, we're very close to when this should happen for Tower 2 here at Starbase. For Tower 1, it took about six months from the base of the tower being more or less completed to having the chopsticks installed in the tower. At 39A, the time in between these events was a bit longer, seven months, but still more or less in the half a year range. The structure for Tower 2's base was completed in early July, so six months later would put us in January of 2025, which is coming up in less than 10 days. Oh god, it's gonna be 2025 in less than 10 days. Anyway, given this, it's not a complete surprise that SpaceX is now working to prepare for chopstick installation on Tower 2. The only difference compared to what SpaceX did on Tower 1 and at 39A is that the truss structure that holds up the red beam has the shape of a triangular prism instead of that of a square prism. Not a huge change, but I guess it's worthy of a mention just in case. And this is a dead giveaway that this script was written by a nerd. Alex, cough, cough, cough. The chopsticks in their carriage system are still being worked on at the Sanchez lot and are still enveloped in scaffolding, so there's clearly still some work to do until they roll out and get installed on the tower. However, we can see more progress has been made in the last week or so, with a bunch of the weld reinforcements on the chopsticks now painted over. This week we've also seen more tank farm work, on top of all the crazy additions that we saw last week. In the area of the new subcoolers, teams have installed a lot more piping, including valves, and more recently, a pipe extension was added to the subcooler closest to pad B. We're far from seeing what this whole shared tank farm configuration will look like, but hey, you know, that's why we're here documenting the construction process. We've also seen high-pressure tanks arriving at the launch site, and these were later lifted and installed near the recently installed vertical tanks located near pad B. Last week, we speculated that perhaps this new set of tanks will be for Pad B's deluge farm, given how the setup looks. Now, the arrival of these long cylindrical high-pressure tanks makes that speculation a little bit more credible. Another piece of work we've seen this week was the removal of the SpaceX sign at the launch site entrance. This sign had been installed almost a year ago, so it didn't last for too long, but hey, it definitely lasted longer than the Gateway to Mars sign on the parking lot at suborbital Pad B. Remember that? There's a good chance that with all the Pad B work, SpaceX may end up relocating all of these walls, and therefore the sign as well. When it was installed back in December of 2023, the launch site limits ended right there. But since they started all the work on Pad B, it's extended a bit further up the road. So the true launch site limits are now different. Perhaps once all of this is completed, the sign will be relocated. Or not. We'll see. Now I'd be remiss if I wrapped up this video without acknowledging one thing. It's Christmas time! This week, SpaceX celebrated the holidays with a festive Christmas parade from Boca Chica Village up to the Starbase production site. This time around, they were a lot better prepared than last year, although the snowmen reappeared again this year. I know Ryan likes those. With the holidays coming up, that means next week we won't have a Starbase update for you, but you can keep following along on Starbase Live as usual. And we'll be back in the new year with a lot more to cover. Thanks to Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video. Remember to use code SPACEFLIGHT or click the link in the description to get 100 free blades with the purchase of a razor. That's going to be it for this week. Thanks for watching along during the year. It really means a lot. Happy 2025. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.